Hello, Schasm. It was, a, it was a little better last year, I don't know. <laughs> All the loud people went. It's time for This Week in Microbiology. This is episode number 113, and today is October 17th, 2015. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. I am coming to you today from La Jolla, California. I'm at the 79th annual meeting of the Southern California branch of the American Society for Microbiology, fondly known as SCASM. And uh, it would not be a twim if I didn't tell you the weather. Now, usually I record this podcast from my office and, we, and our guests call in via Skype. And one of our hosts, I should say, not guests, lives right here in La Jolla. It's Elio Schechter. Anybody know Elio? Yeah. Oh, huh? He's a former chair of Tufts Microbiology. He retired out here. And I ask him, Elio, what's the weather? And he tells me it's sunny and 72 degrees. <laughs> well, guess what? It's not today. <laughs> it rained this morning, and now it's in the uh, mid to high 60s. All right, so we have taken two speakers from this meeting, and they're going to talk a little bit about their work in the time that we have. And the first is the section chief of clinical microbiology at UCLA Medical Center, also an assistant clinical professor in pathology and laboratory medicine, Romney Humphreys. Welcome to TWIM. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. Our other guest is a chief science officer at the CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection, Duncan McCannell. Welcome. Pleasure to be here as well. Thank you for both spending your time here. I know you could leave at this point, but we're educating the world about what you guys do. Great. Uh, so let's do that. And I love to start when we have guests by finding a little bit about how you got here, not what plane you took, <laughs> but your, <I> <laughs> your educational path. So where, Romney, where are you from originally? So I'm from Canada originally. I grew up in northern British Columbia, mm -hmm. about eight hours north of Vancouver. And I did my uh, undergraduate schooling and my PhD in Alberta. And then I came down to Los Angeles to do a uh, clinical uh, postgraduate education program, or CPEP program, mm -hmm. um, at UCLA. And so that's what allows me to be a clinical microbiologist uh, in the United States. So why did you go into science in the first place? What was the catalyst? Or, oh. <laughs> was there a high school teacher? Or something? It was, yeah. I had a, a fabulous high school science teacher, um, really passionate, really got us all engaged in, in science. And I remember I'd been a so-so student up until that point. And, <laughs> and after her class, I was like, man, I need to start hitting the books so I, I can do science as a career and, and you know get to where I want to be. So she was a real uh, change for me, yeah. You know, I've heard that story before. <laughs> People say, you know, I kind of fooled around, and then I got to this point, and I realized I had yeah. to get serious. Pull your socks up and start working Whatever hard. Works. Yeah. <laughs> so I was looking at your uh, your PhD work, which yeah. was on adherence of yes. E. coli. So that seems like a basic science kind of thing, right? So is that what your your thesis was in? Yeah. So it was really basic science, bacterial pathogenesis. Mm -hmm. I looked at a bacteria called Enteropathogenic E. coli right. that used to cause a disease called summer diarrhea in infants and young children in the United States and the key to this organism's pathogenesis was how it bound to the host intestine and the whole goal of my PhD was really figuring out the nuts and bolts of exactly how that happened mm -hmm. and then trying to develop drugs to prevent it from happening as sort of a, a model for new therapies. But you could have taken a basic research track after that. Why I did you have. choose clinical microbiology? Um, so I was I did some work with uh, some of the gastroenterologists at the hospital in Calgary, and I was really interested in the clinical aspects of the work they were doing. Um, I also have a background in public health. I worked at Health Canada for a mm -hmm. couple of years, and so that clinical experience also was also very interesting to me. And I think a lot of people, when they do a basic science PhD, don't realize that clinical careers might be a path pathway for them. And yeah. I was one of those people. I had no idea until a friend of mine was explaining to me about these CPAP programs through the American Society for Microbiology that he was planning on doing. And after I learned about that, I kind of went to the hospital lab, met the people, saw what they did. And to me, that was a much more fulfilling career than a, a real basic science, mm -hmm. uh, where you focus on small problems that are important, but that, you know, it's this very detailed exploration of one theme. Sure. Um, so I was interested in a bit more variety. Yeah, I, I've 
had many PhD students ask me, how can I get into yeah. clinical microbiology? So yeah. that's a tough one if you're not really familiar with uh, how is. to do that. It is. Duncan, how about you? You're also from Canada, right? I am, and actually I did my PhD right down the hall from Romney at uh, the same time. Do you know each other? We do. We do. Yeah. <laughs> because you might not be just <laughs> down the hall sometimes, right? It's a, it's a small world. It but is. Uh, yeah, I was born and raised in southern Alberta in Calgary. Oh. Uh, I went out east to Montreal for undergraduate and then came back and uh, did graduate school, a master's and a PhD at the uh, University of Calgary. You didn't go to McGill, did you? I did go to McGill. Yeah, figured. <laughs> what did you major in? Biology? Uh, biochemistry at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that was maybe one of the turning points for me. Uh, a lot of the model systems that you use in biochemistry are all based on susceptibility. And mm -hmm. I realized I was more interested in the bacteria themselves than, than some of the pathways that we were looking at. And what was your PhD in? My PhD was in molecular epidemiology. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on Clostridium difficile, and at the time, uh, it was sort of following the, the large outbreak of NAP1 uh, that they had in the Montreal area. And so my PhD work incorporated a lot of the data from there. Did you also do a postdoc? I did. Uh, so my story is basically, I, I went down to CDC for a postdoc. Uh, I did State. a postdoc with the PulseNet program, uh, and I never left. Uh, I moved around in the agency a little bit, but uh, it's been 10 years now and I'm still there. That works. I forgot to ask you, did you do a postdoc? I did, so my uh, clinical postdoc. Actually, okay. I did too. I did a, a postdoc in a uh, startup company, a biotech company, developing these novel antimicrobial therapies. And then after a year doing that, I switched and did the clinical postdoc okay. at UCLA. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what you've spoken about at this meeting. Romney, you talked about emerging technologies for antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Yes, yeah. And I think it would be great to tell our listeners um, why, why does it need to be improved? So what's the current state of that testing and why do we need to make it better? Sure, so uh, detecting antibiotic resistance in bacteria is one of the key roles that a clinical lab does. Uh, it helps inform you know, to the physician what drugs are going to work and which aren't, especially today where we have patients that have infections caused by bacteria that are resistant to all antibiotics that we have available. Um, but the challenge is the technologies that we use in the lab for this testing are really old. I mean, they're developed in the 1960s and the 1970s, and we have a great track record with them. However, they take, they require a large number of bacteria, so you need to grow them from the host, and they take a long time to do, you know, at least 18 to 24 hours. And really what we're looking for is how the bacteria respond to the antibiotics, whether they grow or they don't. So it's a, a pretty unsophisticated gauge of bacterial resistance. And so uh, I think the time has come for us to look at newer techniques technologies uh, to detect these. And there's a lot on the market, a lot in development, uh, but the keys are to have it quicker and directly from the patient specimen rather than having to grow the bacteria first and then test it. So you, you gave us some statistics about every hour that you delay okay. does what? Yeah, so every hour you delay in a patient who presents with an infection of the blood, every hour that you delay giving the right antibiotic is associated with a 7% increase in mortality. Um, so the idea is if you wait 24 hours, the outcome for that patient is really not going to be very good. Uh, so, we're, but we're limited, you know, and so physicians deal with this by, you know, starting out with a really big gun antibiotics. They try to cover everything and then they narrow down. But we know with expanding antibiotic resistance, that's not a sustainable solution. We need to be a lot more directed with our therapies. So, for example, um, you, a physician will start someone on a very broad spectrum. Mm -hmm until it's known what the organ, at least the gram state of the organism. Right, right. and you can and then, narrow it down. Yeah, so we call that de-escalating. So they start at the top with the really big drugs and then they stage by stage bring it down until you have a very targeted narrow spectrum antibiotic specific to the bacteria that's causing the infection. So we do have the technologies like Malditoff that you mm -hmm. mentioned, which can help a bit, right? Yeah, so Malditoff is a technology that has come into the clinical labs in the United States in the last two years, really. Mm -hmm. And it's a technology that gives you a much more rapid identification of the bacteria, which is great. So rather than phoning with a gram stain result, you okay. can phone with an identification. But it still doesn't really give us that, that data that the physicians want, which is what drug can I use to treat my patient. Right. So it, it helps a little, but not the full 
full amount. So it's a kind of, it's mass spectrometry basically, right? It is, yeah. So how that technology works is if you think of, you know, bacteria as being little bags of proteins, you blow them up in the system <laughs> and you fly them through the mass spectrometry, um, the mass spec and look at the time of flight for those different proteins yeah. with the idea that the larger ones take a little bit longer to go through the column, the smaller ones go quicker and you get a, a spectrum. Uh, based on that mass and as well as their charge and you can compare a spectrum of a bacteria to a database and so the spectrum for E. coli looks very different from the spectrum for a staphylococcus mm -hmm. or so forth. So uh, that will that can be done without culturing the organism? It, no, you still you need to, to have an it. organism in pure culture. So some labs have developed a way to do this directly from a positive blood yeah, culture yeah. by either you know centrifuging the bacteria out but really you need a bacteria on a plate. Correctly. Can you imagine that one day the resistance profile will be reflected in the proteome, the complete proteome that we would then detect by mass spec? Is that possible? Potentially. I think one of the, the biggest challenge when we talk about dealing with human specimens is the, the vast amount of human proteins that are present there. So the pathogens are such a yeah, tiny piece yeah. of that. So getting that good resolution of the pathogen is, is the challenge. But I mean, with next generation sequencing, we're starting to see that as a technology looking at the DNA, whereas before that was very difficult. Yeah. So, so Duncan, you, we're going to get to next generation sequencing, but could you imagine a day where you look at the entire genome and you would know the susceptibility of the organism? Is that possible? For some markers, you can already do that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, for acquired and intrinsic resistance genes. Uh, for others, uh, like for fluoroquinolone resistance, for example, where it might be point mutation based, um, I'd, I'd be reluctant to make a call without additional information just yeah. because, yeah. Uh, you know, changes in copy number, changes in, you know, very subtle things that aren't necessarily going to show up in a next generation sequencing result. Uh, could impact susceptibility in ways that we don't yet understand. But you would need a pure culture to do that, right? So that's one of the turning points, and that's something that we're definitely concerned about on public yeah. on the public health side. Is as we move towards more culture-independent diagnostic testing, the flow of uh, isolates, pure culture isolates, into the public health system is starting to well has the potential to be restricted. And what that means for our ability to actually look at aggregate trends and susceptibility and strain type and all the other things that we we monitor um, is is something that uh, that is concerning. Right. So Romney, you talked about a knowledge gap of house staff, which was very uh, uh, revealing yeah. to me. Yeah. Tell us, what is that? So I, I think in the lab, you know, we, we really focus and, and, and think about what we do all the time. But if you think about the physician who's taking care of the patient, they are responsible for such a, a huge amount of data that they're receiving about their patient. And so for us to expect them to understand, you know, the nuances of our reports, I think is unreasonable. So we, we did a poll with some of our uh, residents in the hospital, as well as some of the attending physicians, um, just asking them, you know, do you know what a carbapenemase is? And that's an enzyme that a lot of gram-negative bacteria make, which uh, degrade carbapenem therapy antibiotics. And uh, none of the residents had ever heard of that before. <laughs> and two of the attendings did. And when we followed it up with a question saying, you know, what drug would you pick if we told you your patient was infected with a bacteria producing, you know, the specific carbapenemase, almost all of them chose an antibiotic that would have no activity against that organ. Wow. And so I think the lab's role is, is more than just pre generating the results. Our role is really to help interpret those for the physicians so they understand what, what to do with that information. Because uh, like I said, the, the number of lab tests has just increased exponentially and it's really unreasonable to expect somebody to have a clear understanding of all of it. Was that result surprising to you? No, <laughs> it really wasn't. <laughs> wow. How about the audience? You guys surprised by that finding? No. Yeah. It's the wrong audience to ask. <laughs> you, you talked about um, a number of cool new technologies. Maybe we could go through sure, a bunch yeah. of them and explain to people uh, how they work. And, and the first one was Malditoff. Mm -hmm. for, for, how would you use that for susceptibility testing? Right, so if you look at the literature, I mean, multi-tops are a big investment for labs. So everybody's trying to you know, squeeze all the juice they can out of those systems. And 
So in the literature, there's lots of different ways that people have tried to use that mass spectrometry technology to get a susceptibility result. So uh, one way to do this would be to look at the degradation product of an antibiotic mm -hmm. if a bacteria has an enzyme that would degrade it. And so with the mass spec, you can actually see loss of the native antibiotic peak and the degradation peaks showing up. So that's one way. Of course, that only works if there's uh, resistance uh, that's driven by a, an enzyme. Right. Whereas if it's you know um, efflux or uh, you know the antibiotics not getting in because of poor mutation, you're not going to be able to tell. You also need a culture, right? You need a culture <laughs> still. <laughs> so why not? Um, Another way people have looked at doing uh, susceptibility testing with a MALDI-TOF is looking at how the antibiotic changes the protein profile of the bug you're looking at. Right. And so what you do is you incubate the bug with a very, very high concentration of antibiotic, uh, no antibiotic, and then a clinically relevant concentration of antibiotic. And then you look to see if the protein spectrum looks more like the no antibiotic mm -hmm. at that concentration, meaning it's probably resistant because that concentration of antibiotic didn't affect the proteins, or if it looks more like the really high concentration of antibiotic, in which case you would assume the bacteria or the yeast is susceptible um, to that antibiotic. Okay, got it. But is, is that something that can be done on a benchtop, like a, a Bruker Biotype or a Vitec MS? Because you typically those systems look at high abundance proteins in a very narrow yeah. mass to charge range. So they were done on the Bruker uh, Biotype or those systems, but it's a good point. The systems as are sold by uh, the manufacturer as an FDA cleared product for diagnostic testing cannot do this. You need to go in and use them in research use only mode and tweak what area of the protein mm -hmm. spectrum you're looking at for that to work. So, In fact, most of these approaches that you talked about are in the research mode at Absolutely. the moment, yeah. right? And we don't know which one will emerge or, or which ones. The other one you mentioned was digital microscopy. Does that yeah. work? Yeah, so this is some really neat uh, work that's coming out of a company called Accelerate Diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And they're actually probably the furthest ahead of everybody I talk to as far as preclinical trial work. Um, and so what they do is they look at the bacteria present in a positive blood culture, so after it's grown a little bit. And they can identify the bacteria present using fish probes. And then they, uh, once they know what the bacteria is, they incubate it with different antibiotics and visualize with real-time microscopy how the bacteria behaves mm -hmm. in the presence of that antibiotic. And so they look at growth curves, they look at the length of the cells, um, and so forth. And from that data, they can then back calculate what the minimum inhibitory concentration for the antibiotic is. And so that's a process that takes about six hours from the positive mm -hmm. blood culture, whereas today what we do, it's 24 hours to get an organism on a plate and then another 24 hours to get a susceptibility test. So it really shortens the window before which okay. you get an actionable result. And part of that microscopy is to use fluorescence, right, to identify the, the bacterium fish? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Fluorescence in C2 hybridization, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, which is uh, looking for nucleic acids, right? Mm -hmm. is yeah. it, which ones are targeted typically for that? Uh, usually look at the ribosomal, ribosomal. yeah, uh, proteins, or, okay. sorry, nucleic acids, yeah. Fishing, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Then another one was pathogen-specific bioparticles, which had another cool name. What yeah. was it? Smarticles. 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 Yeah. So that must be patented, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's that about? So those are, um, you know, the way I like to think about it is they're almost like engineered uh, bacteriophages. So they're uh, particles that are specific to either um, families of bacteria, or they can be specific mm. to genera, or a specific species of bacteria. Um, and so these smarticles bind to the bacteria, and then insert a, uh, some genomic um, elements that include a luciferase gene. Mm -hmm. And what they do then is add a substrate. And so if the bacteria is alive, it'll take up this DNA and start expressing uh, this luciferase gene and generate light. Um, whereas if the bacteria are dead, they won't. And so what you can do to look at antibiotic resistance is then add an antibiotic to the mix. And if the light goes out, it means the bacteria is killed by the <laughs> antibiotic. And if the light stays on, it's resistant. Okay. Yeah. How did the particles bind to the bacteria to begin with? What's the interaction? So I think it's 
specific proteins on the cell surface. It's all very proprietary at that, this point, wonderful. I'm sure you can yeah. imagine. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> but yeah. With a name like that. Uh, laser light scattering, is that another one? Yeah, so that's essentially using um, fancy optical density. To, to look at bacterial concentrations. This is essentially a, a very accurate gauge of bacterial concentrations. So we use optical density all the time to get a rough estimate of how many bacteria are in a solution. Uh, the challenge with optical density on its own is if you have very big bacteria compared to very small bacteria, the relative concentration that you measure by optical density would be very different because they absorb right. light differently. Right. Uh, whereas this looks at scattering using lasers rather mm -hmm. than um, visual light, and it uh, can look at both the concentration, but it also gives a gauge of size because of the scattering component. And so it's a, really a much more accurate way to get a concentration of bacteria. All right, so, but these so far, these are all culture dependent, right? Yeah, all, all culture dependent. In fact, they all are. All they of them are. are, yeah. It's just a matter of speeding the time up. Exactly. All right. And then you talked about one where the, I think it's an electrosensor, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Where the, the bacteria are held by a tether? Yeah, correct? so it's a, a capture probe on a gold chip, and um, how they detect it is through a passing electric current through mm -hmm. that, and so if the probe is bound, you'll see a different output than if there's no probe bound. Um, and so what they look at is the expression of RNA by the bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and what they found is that you can't really look at the RNA, you need to look at the pre-RNA, mm -hmm. which is before it's all cut up, um, to get a really early read for um, changes in susceptibility. And so the idea is if the bacteria are replicating, they're generating RNA, um, so you're gonna see an increase, whereas if they're not replicating because they're killed by the antibiotic, there won't be any extra RNA present, and you won't see an increase. So it's a very broad assessment of inhibition. It is, yeah. It's not looking at a specific target in any way. No. Which would be interesting, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. And the last one, which I remember, was <laughs> microbial weighing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, these people come up with these great ideas, right? It's great. So uh, that technology is um, through LifeScale. And what they do is they have a little um, you know, nano cantilever that they use with a flow cell through it. It's basically microfluidics, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so um, you have single cells passing through uh, the flow channel onto the end of this cantilever. And the analogy I used is kind of like a springboard diving board. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as you go towards the end of the springboard diving board, it starts to vibrate. And so if you're heavier, it's going to vibrate more. And if you're lighter, it's going to vibrate less. And so they can quantify the number of bacteria that way, as mm -hmm. well as get a gauge and identification. Um, and then they combine that with uh, real-time microscopy, which we already talked about, to look at how the bacteria behave in the presence of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So you could actually identify yeah. by the weight? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Really? Yeah, which is amazing, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, uh, there are lots of different bacteria. I would be surprised that they were had mm -hmm. such specific weights. Mm -hmm. And then you also look at the effect of the antibiotic on the weight itself, yes, right? Yes, that's right, yeah. That's interesting. So of all these, which is your favorite? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I love the bacterial weighing thing because yeah. it's just it's just crazy, right? Yes. It's really really innovative, um, and, and I think we're going to see a lot more really innovative um, uh, technologies coming out. I know we work with our engineering department an awful lot at UCLA. It's like this nice partnership between the microbiology world and the engineering world because they really are coming up with these very complicated solutions. Mm -hmm. To them, it's very simple, but you know, for us, it seems very complicated to approach these problems. Well, that's an interesting point, because whatever, whichever one of these mm -hmm. works and becomes used, it will have to be easy enough to yes. be used on a broad scale, right? Absolutely, it can't yes. can't be complicated. Yes. Technology is always great for solving problems. Last year on this podcast, we had someone who whose company makes a little cartridge for mm -hmm. PCR. You probably know about this, yes, right? Yeah. It was it's just fabulous that you can do it all. And I used to do PCR in the early days when you had to do lots and lots of pipetting. The fact that you can do it in a cartridge was just blew my mind. It was just incredible. Absolutely. Anything else? Does anyone have any questions before we move on to uh, Duncan? This is your opportunity to be uh, to have your 15 seconds of fame. Some microphone <laughs> back there if you want. <laughs> 
I, I believe one of the slides you shared was there was a $25 million prize. Yes. <laughs> you want that, don't you? <laughs> so it, it, maybe this bounces off on, on the question was just asked, which is your favorite, but which one do you think is going to win that prize? <laughs> so I, you know, I don't know that any of the technologies I talked about necessarily meet all the requirements of the prize. And um, so just to back up so the audience knows what we're talking about, um, there's been several uh, prizes announced, uh, both in uh, the UK, which has the Longitude Prize, Europe, um, as well as here in the United States, geared towards in, you know, inciting creative thinking about these problems. And so the prize in the United States is a $25 million prize for the person or the group of people who can come up with a technology that detects antibiotic resistance as close to the point of care, or Duncan used the term the point of need, which I think is really a better term. Uh, to, to impact antimicrobial stewardship and prevent resistance from developing. And so the technologies that I talked about, um, again, because they all still rely on culture, I think that that prize really wants to go for a non-culture approach because it can be done much quicker and right at the patient's bedside as opposed to in the lab, which is you know often several miles away. I think the Longitude Prize story is wonderful, yeah. as you told it, and we'll let our listeners go find it, but to figure out how to figure out your longitude was an ancient problem and a lot of money someone got for it. I wonder what he did with all that money. I don't know. Duncan, let's talk about next generation sequencing and how you can use it for um, diagnostics. Next generation, so I look at that as anything after Sanger and Maxim Gilbert, is that right? That's, that's more or less right. A lot, a lot of the technologies have come out over the past uh, decade, and it's really been a really rapid evolution of, of the ways that they've approached. Uh, some of them have used optical detection. Many of them mm. have an amplification step. Uh, most of them have a fragmentation uh, library generation piece to them that, uh, that basically breaks the genome, shears the genome down, mm -hmm. uh, either uh, enzymatically or physically, uh, into much smaller fragments, and then essentially generates a sequence from there. Uh, but the main point is you're doing very massively parallel sequencing and generating vast amounts of data compared to what we used to do. So I'm an old timer. I used to do Maxim Gilbert sequencing. It took me one year to sequence 7,440 bases, which was the, the genome of poliovirus by myself. One year. How long would that take today? Uh, 10 seconds? It, it would be pretty fast. Well, <laughs> it, you're still limited by the duty cycle of the instrument. So I used to run gels, right? So that's not massively parallel, obviously. So the massively parallel means you can do lots and lots of reactions at once, right? When I was in grad school, I was, uh, <laughs> I, we had to definitely do slab gels, and I still have some hot yeah. flashes at night from <laughs> having to cast them. But these uh, parallel methods uh, use various ways to detect. So we used to look at bands on a gel and, and look at the sequence that way. But these are optical ways of fluorescence, right? Yeah, they'd, they'd either use fluorescence sequencing, very much like how capillary sequencing works uh, with fluorescent indicator dyes, right. uh, or electrochemical detection. Uh, ion right. torrent and some of the others approach uh, work that way. Uh, some of the newer technologies, so there's a number of technologies coming out now that are based on engineered protein nanopores. Uh, and essentially what those are are uh, engineered uh, pores that are put into a membrane uh, in a grid or in a matrix. Uh, and the DNA molecule is uh, deconvoluted and passed through that. Wow. Uh, and from that, uh, it's, it's essentially like reading fingers on a rosary bead as it goes through. It's able to detect uh, bases either in triplicate or, mm -hmm. or other features as they pass through. So you call it, you call not uh, next generation sequencing disruptive, like as in Uber is disruptive for the taxi <laughs> business or an iPhone was disruptive, right? So why is NGS disruptive? Mostly due to its universality. Uh, I mean, uh, the strongest comparison I could probably draw is if you think back to the 70s or 80s when PCR was first introduced as, an, as a technology. Mm. Uh, initially, there were one or two applications, and suddenly there was this explosion when people realized just the, the diversity of approaches that it could be used in the biosciences. Uh, with whole genome sequencing or next generation sequencing, uh, it's very much the same thing. People are still discovering or creating new approaches to deal with the data to, uh, to do very creative and interesting things with it. Uh, and more importantly, especially on the infectious disease side, there's so much that we don't know about um, not only the microbes that we study, but also uh, the environment that they exist in. Yeah. Uh, and this is a very powerful new tool to, to be able to assess that. So the, so the best comparison I like to make is when I was 
doing the polio genome. We would take one virus and do one genome because it took one year, and then we'd spend the next 10 years working on that. Now you can do hundreds or thousands and get a meta picture of what's going on in nature, right? Because of this, it's so rapid. Exactly, and uh, to extend the polio example, one of the things that they're doing for broad scale surveillance is they're actually using metagenomic approaches to sample uh, sewage, mm -hmm. uh, to essentially look at viral diversity, viral presence in, uh, in different populations right. at the aggregate level and to focus public health efforts in that way. So to do NGS, you need a, a pure culture. Well, I guess for discovery you don't, but the kind of work you were talking about, bacterial genomes, you, you'd need pure cultures, right? Oftentimes, but you're not necessarily constrained by that. Um, one of the areas that's very exciting right now is around metagenomics, which is uh, essentially looking at and what we're applying it to is primary specimens. Uh, in fact, we actually ran a challenge competition of our own last year that we called the No Petri Dish Challenge. <laughs> uh, and the challenge that we put out was really, it was a really open-ended, uh, broad question uh, asking uh, challenge participants to come up with an innovative strategy to identify an 0157 H7 mm -hmm. uh, directly from a stool sample uh, mm -hmm. and to provide as much information as they could. Um, on the one hand, you know, there are these wonderful new technologies that we can bring to bear on it. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if you're thinking about trying to pull a single Enterobacter aceae out of a stool sample uh, with all the microbial background that exists there and all the other sequenceable material, it's a, it's a pretty daunting challenge. So if I gave you a, a pure culture and you had all the machinery you needed, how long could you do the entire genome? You know, three, what is it, three billion bases or? Now, that's a human genome, whatever it is. How long would it take? For your average bacteria, it's probably four megabases. Four uh, megabases. You probably wouldn't run that in isolation, but uh, you could really, you're, you're dependent on the speed of the instrument. Uh, on some of the faster instruments, that could be, uh, pro probably the fastest you could turn it around is inside a day right now. So that's the fastest a day. And then how much would that cost? You said less than $60 or so for genome? If, if you're multiplexing and you're running on some of the okay. aluminum platforms, um, the, that's, that's a pretty safe number. I don't think anyone would fight me too much on that. Okay, so you do many samples at once, you bring down the cost. Mm -hmm. But then the bioinformatics, the analysis of the sequence, that takes longer, right? Because humans are involved. <laughs> it, it does take longer. Well, it also depends on what you want to do and how yeah. standardized that approach is and the complexity of the organism itself. Um, if you're trying to compare many genomes against each other, uh, that could be a very large amount of data, especially if you're trying to do large-scale surveillance like mm -hmm. we are. Um, and so that, that comparison can get very large, and you need specialized tools, you need the specialized expertise. Uh, and many of these programming skills, many of these bioinformatics skills are not typical in the public health workforce right now. Yeah. So one of the issues is that you need to take lots of small pieces of sequence and put them together into a genome, right? Does that take a long time, or is that relatively routine? It takes some time to do it correctly. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like if you asked me, if you took apart my car and asked me to put it back together, um, I, I could probably do it fairly yeah. quickly, but it's a question of whether you do it correctly. It wouldn't work. Uh, yeah. And there's different, there's different uh, levels of quality that have been proposed in terms of uh, draft quality genomes, which are perfectly suitable for certain things. Mm -hmm. Uh, higher quality reference, and there's you know essentially almost a metal series, gold, silver, and bronze of, of the different uh, different levels that you'd actually consider for evidence. Something that you might want to use for a future reference sequence, you'd want to do a very careful job and probably do uh, multiple different sequencing technologies, maybe some optical mapping and additional techniques to make sure that you've got the assembly correct, that you're annotating all the genes correctly, and that you uh, you have a lot of confidence in, in what it is. So can you give us a ballpark time for doing it, for putting the car together correctly? Uh, that can take longer. Um, and we, we, really there's, part of the problem is there's really no clear cut way through the maze. A lot of it is defined based on the organism itself, mm. based on the complexity of the genome and the tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, one of the approaches that people often use is uh, a, an approach called hybrid assembly, which uses a lot of these long read sequences, uh, sequences that I, I talked about earlier, the Pacific Biosciences um, and Illumina to essentially get both the long uh, pieces that give you the structure as well as the, the short sequences that give you some of the depth. Uh, 
Uh, recent innovations, though, um, uh, PacBio in particular, has really improved the error rate to the point where we're actually getting pretty decent bacterial assemblies just off the PacBio sequence data alone. So you talked about ways you can make these assemblies using reference genomes. But what if you got a sequence, and this isn't out of the realm of possibilities, that you didn't have any reference for? That often happens with viruses, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say it happened with a bacterial genome. How could you assemble it? Would that be possible? Yeah, typically one of the first approaches somebody might try is uh, something called de novo assembly, which essentially mm. you're, you're just starting to put some of the, the pieces that come out of the sequencer together uh, and see whether they assemble in any sort of logical fashion. Um, that may work, that may not, uh, but it may give you a clue of what type of pathogen you're looking at and, and okay. inform what the next steps might be. So when you're doing a genome sequence, the mobile elements that are separate are the extra chromosomal elements. Do they clearly fall out in their own and, and, be, and you see this is a plasmid or a transposable element, or, or do you have to make efforts to see those? Uh, the answer to that is it depends. Um, <laughs> depending on how you create your libraries, depending on how you handle your specimen, yeah. uh, you may actually lose those because you know, they, they, they are not necessarily equivalent to what you might expect in the chromosomal DNA. Uh, so if your kit, for example, uh, s drops out certain fragments below a certain size threshold, you might lose plasmid, mm. and you, okay. you ideally want to do a separate extraction to make sure that you haven't. You should listen, because someday you may be doing this in a I'm clinical sure, lab, I'm right? I'm sure we will. I'm, I don't sure think it's listening. that far away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, so you <laughs> talked about are. this issue of getting it to public health and microbiology laboratories. Can you see a day where... A lab will have a sequencer and generate these data, or will it always be done at CDC or similar places? The short answer is it's already happening. Mm. Uh, a lot of the technologies are cost effective. Uh, a next gen sequencer costs less than a Bruker Biotyper. Um, it does, it is one of the, those more complex technologies to, I mean, it's not quite as turnkey as, yeah. as a Biotyper might be. Um, and it's, it's much more open ended in terms of the research questions that, that come along with it. Uh, a lot of these instrument manufacturers around next generation sequencing are starting to develop uh, diagnostic certified instruments around particular assays. So you have now the MySeq DX and some, there's the NextSeq DX and some of the others that are coming down the road uh, that are essentially designed around specific, um, specific certified assays. Um, but you know, very much these technologies currently exist in the research realm. Uh, what I think we need to see is a lot of uh, agreement on standards, on yeah. validation procedures. Um, there needs to be a lot of work on baseline data and making sure that we have gold standards around a lot of these approaches. Uh, and that's something that uh, a lot of our federal colleagues are working on very, very aggressively right now. You have one of these machines in your lab? We don't, but we're buying one. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, so we should have one by next year. And what are you going to do with it? So there's a couple things in the clinical lab. One thing is whole genome sequencing mm -hmm. for outbreak uh, identification and tracking. And then the other thing is looking at uh, uh, patients who come in with a disease like meningitis or encephalitis and were unable to detect any kind of pathogen. Mm -hmm. And this happens actually about half the time. Yeah. Um, and so what you can do is a very deep sequence of all of the genomic DNA present in their cerebral spinal fluid or in a um, if they've gone to the extent to get a brain biopsy. And what you find um, in some cases are pathogens sure. present, but they're just at such low, low levels that you wouldn't be able to detect them by routine PCR-based technologies. So there's a couple of really good cases that have come out in the last couple of years. One was a kid that they diagnosed with neuroleptospirosis mm -hmm. using this approach. And uh, essentially, we're able to turn it around in a day or two and target his treatment. And he had a complete recovery of his symptoms. Whereas before this type of technology, the physicians are really left in the dark. They don't know what's going right. on. And this often reveals new viruses. So Absolutely. heartland virus, which you mentioned, was mm -hmm. picked up by deep sequencing. And you can imagine that it would reveal others yes. as well. So are you up on your bioinformatics? You're ready for this machine? <laughs> that's, the, that's the big challenge. Training, yeah. too, yeah. So, yeah, it's the training and, and really the data analysis is the challenge. Uh, Duncan, can you give us some examples? You're in the advanced molecular Diagnostics, is that detection. the detection part of CDC? What do you use NGS for? What are some of the nice examples? Uh, the easier example would be what we don't use NGS for. OK. Um, uh, right now, and actually that's very, very few, uh, 
Our office supports about 40 intramural projects right now that range across all of the infectious disease centers. Uh, and part of that is to make sure that there's some coordination across those. Um, typically, a lot of surveillance activities have evolved into fairly, uh, fairly siloed capabilities, but these technologies really are broadly applicable, uh, and it's, uh, it's something that we can use very broadly. Um, one of the most hallmark examples probably is what's happening around uh, foodborne surveillance. Mm -hmm. uh, last, uh, about two years ago, uh, in collaboration with the FDA, uh, NCBI, and uh, FSIS at USDA, uh, we embarked on an effort to basically do whole genome, se near real time, whole genome sequencing of every Listeria mon monocytogenes in the country. Uh, from both uh, clinical cases as well as environmental and food sources. And from every, you mean all the outbreak cases, right? Essentially every positive culture yeah. that occurs in the United States in, the, in a year. Uh, and there were two reasons for that. One, you know, that it causes uh, very severe uh, morbidity mm -hmm. mortality. Uh, but also it was, it was a case of foodborne disease that, uh, that there were about 1,400 clinical cases each year. So it was a manageable number. We felt that if we, if we set that as the bar, we could, we could see whether this was something that was actually achievable and learn how to work with the data that came out. So when you do this, when you sequence every Listeria isolate, what do you learn? Uh, it's on the well. It's it's interesting. On the on the one hand, we have we're, we have a huge amount of data now at our disposal, mm -hmm. uh, and the approach that is used, whole genome MLST, uh, allows us to have a very uh, fine understanding of of clusters as they emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, we're able to identify clusters much earlier than we have in the okay. past, uh, and. Interestingly, though, it's, it's really caused us to consider how close is close enough. Um, in the past, when we used whole genome sequencing or uh, multi-locus variable number tandem repeat analysis, uh, you had very, very set but subjective criteria in mm -hmm. terms of what you'd look at for an exact pattern match or not. Uh, and you'd have to look at the data kind of sidewise and carefully to make sure that, uh, that you were calling a cluster appropriately. Uh, now that we can look at literally every nucleotide in the genome, uh, how close is, is close? How, uh, how, how relevant does it need mm -hmm. to, or how do we know when it's, a, it's an actual relevant cluster that we need to approach? You are, ma you are generating a lot of data, right? Mm -hmm. What's the, how many giga, peta, teraflops, no, not flops, but <laughs> bytes. Do you have a, a number for us? That's a good question. Uh, for most of our programs, uh, we've estimated that the increase in data output is probably on the order of 100,000 fold. Uh, over what we currently have generated. Uh, I can tell you that the data that's generated at CDC is regularly in the tens of terabytes, if not more, for an individual program. Uh, and that's, you know, basically a, cu a couple months. So it, it depends wow. on the volume that's being put through. Yeah. It depends on the applications, and it depends on the aggressiveness of the sequencing. But it's a, it's a large amount of data. Do you back it up? We do. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, I mean, that, no, that's actually an excellent question. It's a um, lot. When you start dealing with data at this scale, which is not something that is, uh, it's a bit new ground to yeah. many public health agencies, uh, just figuring out how to move that much data around uh, is a huge challenge. And how to mm. replicate, how to back it up, uh, what we need to back up, uh, what we need to retain under F Federal Records Retention Act, you know, there's many different yeah. things that that come into place that, uh, that we're starting to consider now. This is why the internet gets slow. It's his fault. <laughs> Anybody have a question before we wrap this up? You're welcome to find the mic. Oh, there you go. And you better get some hard drives. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. A lot we, of hard drives. We've discussed drives. this, actually. <laughs> we've, uh, we've knocked CDC's network offline more than once. My question is, given that uh, you do a lot of work with antibiotics and that a lot of antibiotics become less useful over time, you both seem fairly optimistic. And I'm curious about where your optimism comes from, what it's, what it's based on. <laughs> well, I mean, I think we, we do see emerging resistance. I mean, there's no doubt about it. When we, we had a, a largish outbreak um, of caused by a bacteria that was resistant to all the currently known available antibiotics. And so we at UCLA obtained a drug for compassionate use that wasn't FDA cleared at the time, but has since become FDA cleared. And during our outbreak, we saw emergence of resistance to that drug. 
So it, you know, it's definitely a problem, and that's why I feel while g genomic data is really cool and it can tell us a lot, there will still probably always be a role of a phenotypic test that is looking to see how the bacteria behave in the presence of that antibiotic. Because if it's something new that we've not seen before, we don't really know how to predict it from genomic data. And in that exact case, what it turned out to be was several factors all sort of converging at the same time. So some extra efflux, the gene jumped plasmids to a higher copy number plasmid, which is really hard to resolve at the genomic level. Hmm. And also there were some porn mutations. So combined, all of that led to this like super, super bug <laughs> that was resistant to like really everything. So I think there will always be a role for, for phenotypic testing. But the flip side, and I think the optimism comes from the fact that we are really getting a lot smarter about using antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And we all realize that the days of, you know, just having a new class of antibiotics come out are over. And so we have to be very careful about how we use what we have today and having good diagnostic tests that allow us to target therapy really early in the game will help, um, you know, hopefully prevent the continual expansion of antimicrobial resistance. There was another question here. Yes. Um, hi. My question is um, on the data warehousing. Who are the big players right now that are developing technologies for this? Is it Google, Apple? Are they the computer people that are developing this? So it's it's interesting. Um, both of the companies you described um, are active in this area. A lot of large tech companies, a lot of cloud companies, have been very active in in genomics and bioinformatics for some time. Uh, Google has recently launched a, a Google Genomics portal, essentially, to, to use their cloud services for data. Uh, a lot of these, though, are geared towards human genomics. And so uh, infectious diseases tend to be a little bit of an afterthought. But that doesn't mean that we can't benefit from and leverage a lot of these same technologies. Um, accessing cloud services for a lot of these analyses um, is an attractive option. Uh, obviously, there are issues around uh, data management and uh, HIPAA compliance and all the other things that feed into that. Uh, but also, there's just logistical concerns. How do you move data around uh, at this scale? Uh, just within most institutions, internal networks to move a terabyte of data around is, is going to be something that takes hours, if not more. So moving it over the internet is a, is a huge challenge. Uh, there have been a lot of initiatives, especially among uh, academic players and a lot of uh, agencies that move large-scale data around uh, to build these high-speed data exchanges. Uh, and I think that's going to be critical, as, especially as these approaches become much more ma mainstream. But the other point is, you know, we're starting to see these technologies in places we didn't expect. Uh, one of the uh, very interesting stories out of the, the recent Ebola outbreak in West Africa was the deployment of these uh, Oxford nanopore uh, uh, small sequencers into the field and to the use of those for, for routine sequencing of clinical samples at the front line. We need, we need a faster internet, too. Well, I was told to stop at 5. Is that? We have, ten, we have 5, 10. So we have about 10, we have ten about minutes. Ten minutes. Are there any other questions? Five, minutes, six minutes. <laughs> Five or six minutes. We can have more questions if you have them. With all the sequencing that you're doing, can you give us an example of how it's benefited us in the public health field? Well, um, I, I would say that the benefits are going to be much more visible in, in the near term. Uh, a lot of what we realized when we started the, the AMD initiative was that we needed to make sure that the CDC systems were, were up to par to actually make sense of this uh, and to be able to deal with these types of data effectively. Um, in the next, uh, we're entering now the phase, though, where we're, we're starting to push a lot of these te technologies, approaches, um, methods that have been developed internally uh, and to push them out into the, into the state labs in, in ways that they can be used in a sustainable way. Uh, and that includes things like platforms. It includes uh, recommendations for, for uh, both the wet lab as well as the informatic workflows. Um, and uh, I realize I'm not actually answering your question then. <laughs> um, but the short answer is you should see a lot. Uh, Foodborne is going to be one of the first ones that will be very visible. Uh, there's a pilot project uh, that includes 10 states uh, starting in the next few months. Uh, 
uh, and by the year's end, that will extend out to 26. Uh, so you'll already start to see that, that footprint. Um, a lot of the other programs, including uh, tuberculosis surveillance and some of the uh, uh, pneumococcal surveillance, meningococcal surveillance, all those are looking at common platforms and uh, leveraging that infrastructure and that investment uh, to apply that to, to other pathogen surveillance activities as well. So there, you can't say of an example where an outbreak has been traced due to next generation sequencing. There's, there's none. Our outbreak was. Yeah. 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 So our we had a outbreak end of last year, beginning of this year at UCLA, caused by a carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumoniae. And it was only identified because my postdocs were doing whole genome sequencing on several uh, carbapenem resistant isolates. And it turned out the outbreak was due to a very unusual organism with a very unusual resistance mechanism that we would not have been able to detect had we not done a a sequence of the genome. And with that information, we were able to develop a PCR, which is a bit quicker than doing a whole genome, and then essentially in almost near real time, uh, identify the outbreak and, and put an end to it much sooner than I think we would have been able to had we not done this. Right. And uh, you know, the CDC experiments experience is very similar to that. Uh, it's been applied to dozens of outbreaks. I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant to single out a single one. I know that I highlighted the caramel apples example uh, with listeria a little bit earlier. Uh, but there certainly are other cases around TB, around uh, many other pathogens where uh, it's been instrumental in understanding transmission dynamics and, and applying that to the public health response. Any others before we end? Like any technology, if it's useful, it will rise to the surface, right? And if not, it won't. But it seems to me there's compelling indications for the great usefulness of NGS. All right, this episode of This Week in Microbiology can be found at iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash twim. If you have an iOS or Android device, that's a disruptive technology, the cell phone, right? You can get an app probably for free that'll play the podcast as well, so you can listen to it on your smart devices or, or, uh, or uh, tablets, I should say. And we always take questions and comments on our show. We answer them as part of each episode. You can send them to twim at twiv.tv. And I want to thank everyone for their participation. Romney Humphreys is at UCLA Medical Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. Duncan McCannell is at the Center for Disease Control. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.tv. WS. I want to thank SCASM for bringing us back and Mark Dubar, SCASM president, for making it happen. I also want to thank Beth Marlowe, the immediate past president. She had us last year. She discovered TWIM because her husband, who's a musician, found it on iTunes. She said, you should listen to this microbiology podcast. And she did. And she said, I want to bring this to SCASM. So that's why we're here. And I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology, which, which supports TWIM, and also ASM for sending Ray Ortega. That's him right there behind the camera. He's our editor, recorder, and producer. Thank you, Ray. The music you hear on TWIM, if you go listen <laughs> online, is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.